يلا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد عليه أفضل الصلاة وأزكى التسليم طيب طوم وطابة مشايك ومتبوأتم من الجنة منزلة إذا إن شاء الله we have a very significant and very important حديث and as you all and as you know all the authentic حديث of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم are very significant and they are part of the sharia, they are part of the deen, they are part of the faith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala approved and uh, gave us subhanahu wa ta'ala for our benefit in this present life and in the uh, hereafter. Today's hadith is very significant. It is narrated by, by Sayyidina Al-Hasan uh, Al ibn Ali uh, radiallahu uh, anhu and we're gonna uh, talk about him a little bit inshallah because this is uh, our first time to encounter him as a narrator in this uh, course and this is our habit right whenever we have a new narrator we talk about him a little bit so let's see let, let me first read the hadith and the title of the hadith the title of this uh, session inshallah is Leave what is doubtful to you. And this is hadith number uh, 11. Hadith number 11. Uh, leave what is doubtful to you or avoiding doubtful matters. Avoiding doubtful matters. And Abi Muhammad al Hassan ibn Ali, radiallahu, uh, al Hassan ibn Ali uh, ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, sabti rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa rayhanatihi, radiallahu anhu ma qal, حفظت من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم دع ما يريبك إلى ما لا يريبك. It's, a very, it's, it's only that. دع ما يريبك إلى ما لا يريبك. This is the hadith. We're talking about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven words. Seven words. Okay, guys. دع ما يريبك إلى ما لا يريبك. It's very, very easy uh, to be remembered. Okay, so Al-Hasan ibn Ali, the grandson of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his beloved, said that he memorized that Allah's Messenger, peace be upon him, said, leave what is doubtful to you in favor of what is not doubtful to you. Leave what is doubtful to you in favor of what is not doubtful to you. This hadith has been reported by, reported by Imam Ahmad, radiallahu anhu, Imam al-Nasai, and Imam al-Tirmidhi, and some of them said it's a Hassan hadith, while others said that it's an authentic uh, hadith. Okay, guys, this hadith it completes it's it, it it completes and it's similar to other hadith that some of them we have mentioned and others uh, are gonna come inshallah later on. The one that we mentioned before is a hadith uh, Sayyidina An Nu'man ibn Bashir, in which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says. إن الحلال بين وإن الحرام بين وبينهما أمور مشتبهات. You remember this, right? The lawful is clear and the unlawful is clear, and there are some doubtful matters between uh, between uh, them. And also, there is uh, the upcoming hadith is going to be narrated by Sayyidina Al Nawas ibn Sam'an, who reported from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam his uh, statement: "البر حسن الخلق." والإثم ما حاك في نفسك وكرهت أن يطلع عليه الناس Piety or righteousness is to have good manners and the sin is what disturbs you in your chest and you dislike people to see you doing. These three ahadith, يعني, uh, the, the, the one that we have today and the hadith in the halal in the haram and this hadith on al-bir, these three ahadith from the 40 ahadith they have similar topics, right? Though they have similar topics, Imam in now mentioned them separately because each one of them has, you know, um, you know, a different angle. Okay, so it's it's very important for us to study them uh, all. As for the hadith, as we said, the topic is to avoid doubtful matters. Whenever you are encountered with a doubtful matter, without you, uh, uh, whenever you are faced with a matter which you don't know whether this thing is halal or haram, what should you do? You should be avoiding that thing. Why? Because it's doubtful and there is no evidence that proves that it is halal. So if there is no solid evidence that proves that or that says that this thing, this matter is halal, so you have to avoid that. You have to practice wara, abstinence. Wara or you know avoidance to avoid uh, what is uh, uh, doubtful. Okay, guys.
And subhanAllah, um, as we said in the uh, hadith of Sayyidina Al-Nu'man ibn Bashir, so the purely lawful things have no doubt for sure, right? But the doubtful matters cause a person to have doubts as to whether it is lawful or not. And the heart doesn't feel tranquil or serene when engaging in doubtful uh, matters. And this results in disturbance and nervousness of the soul. And this is the meaning of doubt. So, whenever you don't feel, you know, that you have that uh, tranquility or serenity in your chest, that you feel something is wrong, something must be wrong. This, uh, I don't want people to see me, you know, doing that or to know that I have done that. If you have that feeling, you should tell yourself that you should be honest with yourself and say that this is the doubtful matter because were it not a doubtful matter you would have done it without you know without uh, in regard to any uh, one right guys like what do you know about Sayyidina al-hasan al-hasan ibn ali the narrator the narrator of this hadith what do you know about Sayyidina al-hasan Sayyidina al-hasan ibn ali Grandson of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes, khairan. What else? Mm, he he was he was not interested in politics in the beginning, but uh, Sayyidina <laughs> Ali Irazi Allah Do you mean him completely? Do you do you mean completely, or he has experienced that, but he relinquished, you know, the authority for a higher purpose? There are okay. details, you know. There are some details in this. Okay. okay. What else? He was older brother, uh, older brother of uh, Hussein Ibn Ali. Uh, okay, uh, older. Um, by how many years? Uh, I believe one year. If I'm not mistaken. One year. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Uh -huh. One yeah. year. Yeah. Uh -huh. Year. Good. Good. What else? For Rayhan al Jannah, right? And he is one of the two masters, right, of the youth in paradise. Right, guys? Yes. The Yida Shabab al Jannah. Right. Okay, type. Uh, that's good. Inshallah. Inshallah. Okay, so Sayyidina al Hassan, he uh, is the son of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, right? And he is the uh, descendant of uh, Abdul Muttalib, for sure, uh, from, the, uh, 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 from Hashim. Uh, the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right guys? And he is the grandson of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he is described in this hadith and in, you know, um, uh, many other places as uh, a subt, subt Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the word subt in the Arabic language means or it designates a grandson, right? Why we have in Arabic another word for a subt or the 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 the, uh, the son's son which is known as a hafid right hafid or a great grandson great grandson so he is the hafid or the great grandson of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prophet uh, muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam described him in one of the hadith as uh, being a virtuous uh, leader and the fragrant blossom in the garden uh, and he uh, uh, he is the chief among the youth destined for paradise. Sayyid Shabab al al Jannah or Sayyida Shabab al Jannah, talking about Al Hassan and Al uh, Hussein. Uh, uh, he is for sure, he is the son of Sayyida Fatima, Al Zahra, Sayyida Fatima, عنها, the daughter of the Prophet. He was born in Sha'ban during the third year uh, of the Hijrah. And uh, um, some scholars say that, you no, know, he was born in, in, you know, um, in the middle of Ramadan. And he, uh, uh, he is older than Sayyidina al Hussein by a year. And he uh, performed pilgrimage 25 times. MashaAllah. He performed pilgrimage or Hajj 25 uh, times. And he assumed the mantle of leadership after his father, Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he governed for approximately six months. Uh, and he uh, uh, governed Al-Hijaz, uh, al Yemen, Iraq, and Khurasan. And to show magnanimity, he and, and, and piety and forbearance for sure, he voluntarily relinquished the caliphate to Muawiyah. 
And in, in doing that, he fostered the unity among the Muslim uh, Ummah. And he transmitted 13 of the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he uh, died. Uh, he, he was poisoned and he died as a martyr. And we ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala to accept him among the uh, martyrs, among the al-shuhada. Al Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, foresaw that Al-Hasan uh, would be a peacemaker, peace, uh, peacemaker. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in, in his statement, indeed, my son is a master and Allah will reconcile through him between two factions of Muslims. And this, this prophecy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam materialized when he relinquished, you know, uh, 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 the caliphate to uh, Sayyidina uh, Muawiyah. And that, alhamdulillah, يعني, facilitated the reconciliation between the followers of Sayyidina Muawiyah and the supporters of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi uh, Talib. Okay, guys, so this is a very brief, a very, very uh, brief account on uh, Sayyidina Al-Hasan ibn Ali radiallahu anhu radiallahu anhu ajma'in. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this hadith says, دَعْمَا يَرِيبُكَ إِلَى مَا لَا يَرِيبُكَ دَعْمَا يَرِيبُكَ إِلَى مَا لَا يَرِيبُكَ Leave what is doubtful to you in favor of what is not doubtful uh, to you. So uh, if you want to, if you want to uh, sever, you know, any doubts, if you want to serve any doubts, you do that through certainty, right? And when you do that, your soul can feel at ease and tranquil uh, because um, you have abandoned and you have served and you have distanced yourself from any doubtful uh, matters. Um, Abdul Rahman Al Umari, Abu Abdul Rahman Al Umari, one of our great uh, scholars, uh, said that. If the slave is, uh, if the slave had has uh, wara, or if the slave is uh, abstinent, they would abandon what is doubtful to them in favor of what is not doubtful to them. So, if you are presented with two matters, one of them is doubtful and the other is not doubtful. One of them has some doubts and whether it is halal or haram and there is no clear evidence as we mentioned before. So you have to avoid that doubtful uh, thing and you resort only to the uh, thing that doesn't have any doubts. Okay. Sayyidina al-Fudayl, Sayyidina al-Fudayl ibn Ayyad said that people think that wara or abstinence is very hard. People think that wara is very hard. And, and he continues saying, any time I was posed with two options, I chose the harder thing. Therefore, leave what is doubtful to you in favor of what is not doubtful to you. And uh, Al-Hasan Al ibn, uh, Hasan ibn Sinan used to say, nothing is easier than wara. Nothing is easier than wara. If something is doubtful to you, then abandon it. But for sure, yeah, this is easy for someone like Al-Hasan and someone for, you know, yani for yeah, Al-Hasan. Yeah, and Al-Fudayl ibn Ayyad said that uh, wara is, um, you know, yani they say, he, he said that people think that wara is very hard, right? So it's, it's, it's easy for those people. But as for us, we are ordinary people, right? So it's, it's not that easy for us, but it can become easy when we know. When we know what we should do whenever we have a doubtful thing right in front of us. Right, guys? And so Hisham ibn Hassan said that Muhammad ibn Sirin. Who's Muhammad ibn Sirin, guys? Who's Muhammad ibn Sirin? Have you heard that name before? Muhammad ibn Sirin. Yeah, Muhammad he was one Sirin. of the early Salaf. Uh, he was one of the early Salaf uh, who was also uh, like a knowledgeable scholar. Yes, but in, in which specialization? He was... Uh, he, he told about the dreams. Yes, uh, perfect. That's the one. That's the one. He was a muhaddith. He was a muhaddith. So he was a scholar in hadith, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as well as the interpretation of the dreams. And he had his, you know, mawsu'a or encyclopedia on the interpretation of the dreams. This is Muhammad ibn Siri. So Hisham ibn Hassan says that, says that Muhammad ibn Sirin abandoned 40,000 things, 40,000, 40,000, 40,000, Muhammad ibn Sirin abandoned 40,000 uh, 40, things that you don't see as being problematic. So this tells us 
how much wara he has in his heart. But guys, okay, guys, 40,000 things that you don't see as being problematic. We see, we, 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 you know, we, we see, we deem them, you know, uh, um, not problematic in any way, but as for him, no, they are doubtful things. And that's why he abstained from doing or saying, you know, or dealing with these uh, things. What about one's, uh, 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 you know, uh, the earning of one's wealth? Our pious predecessors, Salaf al Salih, they used to have wara. They used to have wara when it came to earning their wealth. They used to have wara when it came to earning their wealth. And that's, uh, um, and that's what made them, you know, abstain from the dunya and acquire so little of it and be satisfied with, uh, uh, with little. And they also, uh, uh, many of them, they uh, would learn trades that had no element of doubt in them. For example, some of them work, you know, in the manufacturing with palm leaves and the others uh, uh, would be scribes and some would transfer you know loads or work in construction and so forth they would keenly seek lawful sustenance and earnings and would fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in what they would take into their stomachs and what they would give to their families and their uh, children uh, causing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put barakah in their livelihoods and their children and their uh, times or uh, days as for us as for us, if we find that there is a dealing that the scholars have differed over, what should we do, guys? If you know that this matter has been, you know, a matter of controversy between the uh, or among the scholars, uh, uh, some of them say this is halal, while others say no, this is haram. What should we do? What should we do then? If we have a difference or a dispute among the scholars uh, regarding a specific thing, some of them say that this is halal, while others say this is haram. What should we do? First Quran, then Hadith, and then our heart. Ma, they are scholars. They know the Quran and they know the Hadith. But they but interpret. They but they interpret of... ma, ma, this is the cause of the difference. This is the cause of the difference or the disputes, the differences among the scholars. That they may interpret. They may interpret the Hadith and the uh, Ayah. Okay? in different ways because they they will never they will never dispute they will never dispute regarding something which is very clear right yeah. so if we have something the scholars have differed over what should we do uh they say as uh, one saying they say al an al khilaf sunnah like when you ex exit the difference of opinion for example one scholar says it's makru another says it's haram so to take the safer opinion, you should assume it's haram and not avoid it completely. Yes. Even though some scholars may say it's uh, mubah or makru, let's say. Yes, perfect. Jazakumullah khairan. So if we find that there is a dealing that the scholars have differed over, um, some say it's lawful and others say it's not lawful, then we have to realize that we have a lot of other dealings that we can engage in that are lawful. So we have to abandon the unlawful dealing out of wara. Okay, guys, and get ourselves of the differing of the scholars, just just as uh, uh, Khalil uh, had just said. Okay, guys, so we have to, you know, remove ourselves from that difference, and we resort or we seek what is, uh, you know, what is what is um, what is um, uh, what can draw us closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala by avoiding anything that is, you know, doubtful or unlawful. Uh, Unless, and this is for sure, Yani, and, and of course, unless the authentic evidence clarifies that there is nothing wrong with that dealing. And at that time, it would be uh, something clearly lawful, uh, 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 um, uh, wherein there is no uh, harm. Okay, guys? So, what I is to abandon what they differed over until it is uh, clear that there is no doubt in the uh, issue. And this is... This is, you know, contrary to what um, some people face or may face in terms of the whisperings of the devil. The whisperings of the devil, you know, in regards to the purity, the purification, you know, purity or the prayer or fasting. And whisperings are something completely different from wara. 
and it is legislated that it should be rejected and one should prevent their soul from following them. So if you have some whisperings from Satan, from the devil, you have to avoid this. And this is not wara. This is, you know, something completely uh, different. Um, some people, some people, and you may, you may have, you know, witnessed that. Some people may uh, abandon some actions that lead to abandoning an obligatory action. Okay. And they say that this is wara. Let me give you an example. Someone who abandons the Fajr prayer in congregation, in Jama'ah, in the mosque. Why? Because the Imam performs supplication in Fajr prayer, which is Qunut. And this is contrary to the uh, Sunnah, according to some Madahib. And if one does that, their wara is corrupt and is not the same wara mentioned in the Tashri'ah or the legislation and the wara that the Salaf used to uh, practice. Okay, guys, uh, some people abstain from some matters, but then fall into the destructive sins. And this is corrupt wara as well, without a doubt. There are types of wara. There are, according to the scholars, there are different types of wara. Wara, and we have three types. One type is the to abstain from the unlawful, and this is for sure, this is obligatory, right, guys? To abstain from the unlawful, to abstain from al-haram, this is obligatory, and to abstain from doubtful matters, and this is recommended for sure, and to abstain from some lawful matters out of fear of falling into unlawful matters, and this is the highest level of wara. This is the highest level of wara. Al-Hafiz ibn Hajar said that Imam al-Ghazali, alayhi rahmatullah, Imam al-Ghazali said, al-wara is of two types. We have four types according to Imam al-Ghazali. The first one is the wara of the Siddiqeen. Wara of Siddiqeen. And Siddiqeen means the truthful and the sincere ones. Wara of Siddiqeen. And it is to abandon everything that is not induced uh, with the intention of gaining strength in worship. Anything, anything that you do that do not, you know, fall under or into the category, fall under the category of making you stronger, you know, in uh, worship, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a better way, this is, should, this should be avoided. This should be, uh, you know, avoided or abandoned. And this is the wara al siddiqin And the second type is wara al muttaqin the wara of the pious, in which uh, you abandon whatever has no doubt in it out of fear of it leading to something unlawful. And this is the kind of wara that our pious predecessors uh, exercised. Also, we have the third one, which is uh, wara of the righteous, wara al salihin, uh, which to abandon anything that might possibly be unlawful, with the condition that it is a viable possibility. Because if it is not a viable possibility, this will fall under the category of whisperings of that devil, uh, which we should be avoiding, right? And the fourth type of wara is wara al shuhud, the wara of the witnesses in which to abandon anything that makes one's testimony invalid, you know? Um, you know, in the past, in the past, you know, um, uh, Muslim judges uh, used not to accept the testimony of anyone, okay? Uh, um, you know, certain people like, uh, and, and that happened, you know, in, even in, in my country, in, uh, in, in Egypt, uh, till, I believe, till the 50s and the 60s, uh, the courts and judges, uh, used not to accept the testimony of uh, the actors and actresses, those artists, you know. Why? Because they had no, you know, that 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 owner, that dignity. Um, um, this is, you know, so some people, okay, according to this, this is a very broad, uh, broad uh, topic, um, you know, what uh, is shuhud or the what of the witnesses, when you abandon anything that makes one's testimony invalid, you know, uh, people who eat, the, and that was in the past, people who would eat in the markets, they said that those uh, uh, people who are not working in the market, if they eat in the market, their testimony wouldn't be, you know, 
wouldn't be accepted something like that so you can you can you can you can see yani how far those scholars uh, uh, went also what we what we get from this is that the intent of the muslim should be to be in the middle to be in the middle and this is what is uh, required said abdullah ibn abbas uh, reported that it was said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam قيل لرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أي الأديان أحب إلى الله قال الحنيفية السمحة which religion the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was once asked which religion is most beloved to Allah which religion is most beloved to Allah the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said الحنيفية السمحة the monotheistic and lenient religion the monotheistic and lenient religion. And Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah commented on this hadith as saying that monotheistic religion is against polytheism and the lenient religion is against strictness and constriction. So being in the middle, being in the middle, al-wasat. So, وَكَذَلِكْ جَعْنَكُمْ أُمَّةَ وَسَطَ أُمَّةَ وَسَطَ So this is the middle course. Okay, guys? So the... The purely lawful matters are clear, uh, as they are purely unlawful uh, uh, matters. Uh, rain, the rain that falls from the sky, guys, is it lawful or unlawful? The rain that falls from the sky. Unlawful. Pure? Yeah, it is pure, right? It is pure without a doubt. Right, guys? Right. right. What about the fish? The fish that's caught in the sea or the rivers. Is it lawful or unlawful? Uh, it's lawful unless there is a the restriction of fishing on yeah, some of the fishes. Okay, okay, but but generally speaking, they are they are lawful, lawful right? What about interest, riba, or usury? What about unlawful. fornication? Fornication, unlawful. Uh, adultery, unlawful. Uh, what about um, or uh, or bad treatment of parents? Unlawful. Unlawful for sure. These are clearly unlawful. However, between the lawful and the unlawful, there are these doubts. There are some doubts, right? And some of the doubts or some of the doubtful matters are closer to being lawful while others are closer to being unlawful. And those who avoid these doubtful matters and avoid what is confusing to them and results in worry and distress for them have made themselves safe and sound. So if you want to if you want to make yourself safe and sound, you have to avoid any doubtful matter. OK, guys. And according to Al Hassan, as we said before, it's very easy for someone to do. And uh, Muhammad ibn Sirin, he have a, he has abandoned how 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 many doubtful matters? How many? Forty thousand. Sirin, forty thousand doubtful matters in which we see no harm. Right? In which we see no harm. Right, guys. Can we see his list? <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good that's a good one. Okay, we'll try to find it here if it's there. Yeah. But I don't believe yeah, anyone has enumerated these things here. You know, okay. Allah understand. Type. What if what if uh, uh, the lawful is mixed with the unlawful and is unclear? What if we have a mixture of lawful and the unlawful things and that, that that's not clear? For example. If we have, I'm asking you guys, if we have an uh, an animal that wasn't slaughtered, okay? If we have an animal that wasn't slaughtered and it becomes confused with a slaughtered animal, okay? And we don't have any clue. We don't have any evidence which one is, which one, uh, is the, the one that was slaughtered and which one uh, was, you know, uh, wasn't slaughtered. What should we do then? Leave both. Perfect. Yes. We should give preference to the unlawful aspect and it becomes obligatory to avoid both of them. Perfect. Jazakumullah khayran. Taib, what if, what if, what if someone tells you as a man, okay? What if someone tells you that one of your cousins, a man or a woman, one of your cousins, uh, uh, is uh, is your sister from cycling? Okay, 
one of your cousins is your sister from cycling but we don't know which what should we do now avoid all the cousins perfect yes طيب what if anyone other than sister Sophia guys is that the sister Sophia another one if someone knows that the wealth of this life, the wealth of this life, this whole life is all mixed with unlawful substance, substance, okay? Without a doubt, such as being, you know, mixed with interest, stolen, and usurped money, and so forth. Huh? What should we do? Can, can anyone, can anyone say that all the wealth of this world is prohibited? Can anyone say that? We know no. that the central banks, the central banks control everything, right? Everywhere, all over the world. And we know that the central banks and all the banks, they deal with riba, right, guys? But can anyone say that all the wealth in this world is prohibited? No. For sure, no. no. For sure, no. Because why? Because this is impossible. It's impossible and difficult to instill such a price, right, guys? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he entered Al Madinah, he knew that the wealth of its people had some aspects of unlawfulness, such as interest, right? Right, guys? However, the Prophet ﷺ still dealt and engaged in transactions with its residents, as did his Sahaba. But, but the Prophet ﷺ didn't, you know, accept that for a long time. The Prophet ﷺ first try to establish a market. Okay, in the Medina, when the Prophet Sallallahu and the Sahaba migrated to, from Mecca to al Medina, they found there six markets. There were six markets. And all the six markets were controlled by the Jews. And there were many unlawful, you know, dealings and transactions there. And the Prophet Sallallahu the Sahaba, they found it, you know, it, it was difficult for them, but they engaged in trade with those people for some time. And the Prophet وسلم, in order to avoid all these, you know, doubtful things uh, or, or, or dealings and transactions, the Prophet وسلم, established a market. The Prophet established a market. And one of the leaders of the Jews went to that market and, you know, demolished it. But then the Prophet وسلم, established another market and it was, you know, in a very strategic place or location in Al Medina, and all the trade, uh, all the traders who came from, you know, outside Al Medina used to go to that market before going to the six markets of uh, the, that were controlled by the Jews, and that market became the first market and the biggest market in the Medina. So the Prophet وسلم, in a very clever way, and for sure he was taught that by revelation by Al Wahi. The Prophet وسلم, shifted that economic hegemony from the Jews to uh, Muslims in a very clever and smart uh, way. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And for sure, in the market of the Prophet وسلم, there was no any unlawful dealings or suspicious or doubtful uh, dealings or transactions uh, there. Okay, guys. <clears throat> what if? What if? Uh, if we have something lawful that cannot be enumerated and it is mixed with something unlawful that cannot be enumerated as well. Like like the wealth. Like the wealth. Huh. Hi guys. What should we do? No one, no one can say that the whole of it is unlawful. No one can say that the whole of it is unlawful unless we know for sure that there is indicative evidence showing that some part is unlawful. If we know that this part is unlawful and we have evidence for that, we must, it's obligatory, it becomes obligatory upon us to avoid it. But if not, so we deal it. And we mentioned the uh, example of the Sahaba uh, who, uh, you know, who... Uh, who lived uh, uh, in Al Medina during the uh, lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, especially in the beginning, uh, when uh, transgressors, transgressors entered the Medina, 
uh, and they sold uh, usurped and stolen goods in its markets, but the Sahaba didn't refrain from dealing with the merchants in this market, not necessarily with those traders, but, you know, no one say that, no one can say that. If there is something uh, which is usurped or stolen that was sold in a specific uh, market, that you should avoid dealing with anyone from that market. No one can say that because this will pose a very difficult, this will pose difficulty on uh, uh, Muslims and on the uh, people. Okay, guys? Bye. Mm -hmm. Okay. What if, what if, um, if you enter the home of a Muslim who is known to be a good Muslim and they present food, okay? Should you be asking them should you be asking them about the food and where they purchased it? No. Why? This becomes because a he, Yeah, yeah, okay. Be, go ahead. Because he's Muslim. Because he's be sure. Muslim and yes, because he is Muslim and we have to have, you know, good um, good uh, good thoughts. Right? Good thoughts about Muslims, right? Unless we know that those people are violating the legislation, legislation are violating the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, guys? So if you enter, Jazakallah sister, if you enter the home or the house of a Muslim who is known to be a good Muslim and they uh, present food, it is not wara or caution or, you know, um, um, to ask them about the food and where they uh, uh, got it uh, uh, from. And this is called uh, wara. However, um, if anyone says that uh, you shouldn't be asking, you shouldn't be asking, you must not ask. This is also, you know, this is not that, um, you know, this is not accurate as well, because uh, asking might be obligatory or recommended or disliked or unlawful. Okay, guys, depending on the situation and the indicative evidences or doubts that come about. Let me give you some examples. Uh, if someone is known to be virtuous, knowledgeable, and pious, just like uh, Sister Sophia, okay, and yani, uh, yani, we, uh, we, 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 um, Subhanallah, yeah, yeah. we, um, we always think good about her. Alhamdulillah, and she deserves that. If someone is known to be virtuous, knowledgeable, and pious, then one shouldn't ask. Okay, guys. If she offers you food, you take it and you say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. <laughs> and if the person is known to be a good person among the people, then one shouldn't ask as well. And if there are evidences showing that the income of someone is unlawful and that they know that this particular food has been stolen or usurped, it is impermissible to eat that food. Right, guys? But if the lawful and the unlawful become mixed and one cannot tell which is the unlawful, huh? what should we do? The lawful is mixed with the unlawful. What should we do? And we cannot tell. There is no uh, uh, evidence. What should we do? We have to avoid We have things. to avoid it. Wara dictates to avoid it altogether. Okay? Okay. Uh, who's gonna who's gonna answer this? Who's gonna answer this? Uh, Sister Hamida. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, brother Waqar. Assalamu alaikum. Where are you guys? Okay, anyone anyone answers with us? If the earnings, if the earnings of the father are from unlawful sources, what should the child do? What should the son or the child do? If he knows that the earnings of his father are from unlawful sources, what should one do? Anyone? Uh, if possible, they should, uh, I guess, uh, if they can, if they have their enough money to actually get their own food, I guess they should go with that. What, uh, if, but what if they not, what if they, they, uh, they, they couldn't afford that? I guess in that case, it may be, it may be allowed. It but, may be allowed. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, جزاكم الله خير. That's correct. Wait, wait. So, if the earnings of the father are from unlawful sources, then the child can take from the earnings of their father, which is necessary. Okay? Which is necessary. Only what's necessary. Even if the father's earnings are unlawful. Okay, guys? And the child shouldn't take in abundance from the wealth of the father. Because that necessary spending that is legally and religiously obligatory on the father is in uh, uh, what his children need in terms of home, uh, clothes, food, drinks, and so forth. Okay, so he should take or one should take what is obligate, what is you know necessary, only what is necessary, and at the same time the child should strive to be self-sufficient. Okay, guys. The child should strive to be self-sufficient, not in need of uh, their father's unlawful wealth as much as they are able. And also, at the same time, they shouldn't be leaving the father like that. Right, guys? It's obligatory. It becomes obligatory upon them to call the father to the truth and to admonish him in goodness and supplicate for him to be guided and earn lawful earnings. Okay, guys? And honesty is tranquility and lying is doubt. And this is, by the way, this is in some narrations of this hadith, in some narrations of this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ towards the end mentioned that leave what is doubtful to you in favor of what is not doubtful to you. And the Prophet added uh, in, in some narrations, goodness is tranquility and the evil is doubt. Goodness is tranquility and evil is doubt. And in another narration, it states honesty is tranquility and lying is uh, doubt. And uh, Imam Ibn, uh, Ibn Rajab, he uh, said that the statement of the Prophet وسلم, which states goodness is tranquility and the evil is doubt means that the hearts are tranquil towards good things, but are disturbed and do not feel tranquility towards evil things. And this shows that one should go back to their heart in times of doubt. Imam Ibn al-Qayyim says that, and uh, I'm going to end with this, inshallah. He said that the mere issuance of a fatwa by a mufti doesn't justify action unless one's soul finds tranquility in it. And there is a wholehearted acceptance without hesitation or order. What does this mean? This means that if you need a fatwa, if you need a fatwa, if you want to, if you if you need to you know whether this thing, whether this transaction or this thing is lawful or unlawful, and you go to a scholar and you ask for a fatwa from him, and he gives you the fatwa. If that scholar is uh, righteous and pious, and you know that for sure, and everyone knows that for sure, and your heart becomes tranquil, your heart becomes at ease upon hearing that fatwa, you should take it and apply it. Right? But if not, if not, if you find something, you know, irritating in your person, irritating in your heart towards that fatwa, you shouldn't be accepting it. You shouldn't be acting upon that fatwa. And this aligns with the guidance of the Prophet وسلم, who said, استفتي نفسك وإن أفتاك الناس وأفتوك. استفتي نفسك وإن أفتاك الناس وأفتوك. Consult your heart, even if people continuously give you fatwas. And don't say that as we, you know, many people say it in, in my country. يعني, uh, lay or put the responsibility on the neck of the scholar or the mufti and you're going to be safe. No, no, no. You have to feel comfortable about or regarding that fatwa that you have heard from that scholar. And if not, you should avoid it. You shouldn't apply it. You shouldn't uh, put it into uh, action. This hadith guys as we said is a root and fundamental in the topic of wara or uh, abstinence from uh, uh, doubtful matters uh, and avoiding doubtful matters and being fearful of all types of unlawful uh, things and according to many scholars wara is easy and wara produces tranquility and comfort in the heart of the uh, muslim okay guys Yani here we come to the end of this uh, yani, uh, hadith. I know it's um, it's it's a short hadith, but it has so many, you know, uh, uh, so many, uh, let's say, um, uh, aspects and uh, so many, um, 
uh, forms of um, of application in the uh, society. So if you have any question, uh, I'll be more than willing to answer them if I know, inshallah. So this terminology, vara. So this is like, I mean, I, I know about that, but is this the like, only for the unlawful matters which we have to leave is called is defined as wara. It's a, okay, wara, wara, wara. No, no, no. When it comes to the unlawful things which we should avoid, the unlawful things which we shouldn't be doing, this is called the nahya. Nahya. Okay? Prohibition. Okay. We ha we have amr and we have nahya, right? Amr, which is you know uh, wajib or amr. When we are ordered to do something lawful by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we can do it, we have to do it, we have to do it, right? But if we are prohibited from doing something, this is called the nahiyya. But here, wara, wara is uh, usually linked with, you know, abstinence, uh, uh, abstinence and, uh, you know, uh, avoiding doing the things that are uh, uh, doubtful. This is uh, wara. But if you abstain from doing something which is unlawful, unlawful, clearly unlawful, this is, you know, nahiya. Okay, guys? All right. Thank you. Okay. What else? Alhamdulillah, we don't have any questions. Jazakumullah khair. Barakallahu feekum. I um, yeah I, I was too busy to upload the uh, uh, last week's uh, video. Inshallah, Inshallah today I'm gonna upload both uh, videos. Inshallah last week's and today's. Inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. And uh, hopefully you're gonna find some questions there as well in the comments section under the uh, videos. Inshallah. Yeah, just uh, but, one comment to also because yeah sure like, uh, the, the 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 hadith mentions okay da'ma yaribuk ila ma yaribuk so. What, what is yes. So uh what's doubtful to one person may not be doubtful to another person. So what's doubtful, for example, to you may be not doubtful to me, or maybe not doubtful to somebody else, right? So mm -hmm. I guess based on what based on what Khalid, yeah, we based on what we have the the benchmark, we have the gauge or the benchmark in the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whether this thing is whether this thing is you know clearly or purely lawful or you know purely unlawful and as we said mom okay okay no mm, I got your point yani, uh, Hassan ibn si Muhammad ibn Sirin Muhammad ibn Sirin used to avoid 40,000 things which other people deem as you know they, they find no problem with them they find them not uh, problematic right guys so, as you said, yeah, it differs from one person to another. Yeah, and the levels, oh, and the levels of what are, are different as well. Yeah, okay, go ahead. I see, I see what you mean, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah, is that the Imam uh, uh, Ahmed Humble's uh, example? I, I don't know, like, I don't remember the it who, who it is linked to. When he used to go for shopping for grocery, he wouldn't take the wrapper because he would say, I haven't paid for that, and that's not lawful for me. Um, okay, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, I have heard that story before. He, you know, he, um, he, um, one day he was on an errand and he felt tired and he leaned his back to a wall, you know, the wall mm -hmm. of the garden owned by, by someone else. And then he, you know, he left immediately. He left when he remembered that he didn't, uh, he didn't seek the permission of the owner of the garden or the wall to, you know, to um, to um, to uh, to make use of the shade to make to make use of the shade the shade. without, you know, seeking permission. But this is, you know, those people are. You can feel that those people were from another planet. You know, uh, that's so, true. Yeah. Okay, Sheikh, one of the hadiths is uh, uh, one uh, 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 Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, uh, "What is sin?" Uh, he said, uh, "The things that uh, will be doubtful in your heart." Yes, yes. And true. if you uh, if you uh, leave that thing, uh, Allah will give you better from uh, that thing. 
Yes. Okay. Let me let me let me let me recall this uh, hadith. This hadith is in uh, Sahih Muslim, uh, and he, and it is narrated by Sayyidina Al Nawas ibn Sam'an, in which he said, uh, "Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, 'Al birru ma uh, al birru husn al khuluq, wal ithm ma haq fi nafsik, wa karihd ay yatali alayhi al nas.' Piety or righteousness is to have good manners." And the sin is what disturbs you in your chest and you dislike people to see you doing. And I believe we have mentioned this hadith in the beginning, right? So when you feel comfortable about doing uh, um, something which is lawful for sure, so this is a sign of bir or husn al khuluq or to, uh, that you have good manners. But if you have something which you are afraid of people, you know, uh, seeing you while you are doing that or you hide yourself while you're doing that, uh, or you feel empowered that, that people will, you know, this will be divulged, this will be exposed to uh, to others. For sure, this is sin. And this is an, uh, an if, يعني, no one, no one dislikes um, uh, being seen while he is reciting the Quran, right? Unless, unless for sure, يعني, um, he, he fears that people, some people may say that he is, you know, showing off. But this is something else. But for sure, if you uh, hold the, the the mushaf in your hand between your hands in your hands and you read the Quran, this is something good, right? And you don't feel embarrassed uh, uh, if anyone sees you. But what if someone who hides himself from people, someone who is holding his uh, uh, mobile phone and he is looking at you know unlawful stuff, unlawful things? For sure, he would hide himself from others, and he would be very embarrassed if anyone. If anyone seeing him uh, in that situation, right? Okay, guys. 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 إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر جزاكم الله خيرا بارك الله فيكم سي يو نيكست ويك ان شاء الله السلام عليكم الله وعليكم السلام وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته